We started talking last time about Jesus as God and Trinity as the Godhead, because there are many people who have been asking questions lately. You know, is Jesus really God? We know he's a son of God, but is he God also? And how does that work? And so that's a common question that we get and was a topic in what's up recently. And then somewhat related to that, there's questions about the Trinity and people feel like, you know, the Trinity is not a biblical topic because that word's nowhere in the Bible, but actually Trinity and Godhead, it's the same thing. So in the word Godhead, it is in the Bible. And um, so anyway, so we're going to continue with this. We'll finish it up. I only have two slides on that, so it's not going to be a whole lot to go over. Let's just do a quick recap of what we talked about last time. So we're not going to go through this in detail. But first, whenever anybody asks a question, is Jesus really God or is he just, you know, the son of God? You know, you always go back to John chapter one and we'll just read a couple pieces of this. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Okay, so there's the answer right there. Verse one, you know, the word existed in the beginning. The word himself was God, was with God. Amen. And then in verse 14, we see that it's talking about, you know, the word became flesh and it's referring to Jesus. So anytime somebody asks you the question, you know, is Jesus really God? And, you know, I know he's a son of God, but is he really God? Is he from everlasting, you know, in the past? And the answer is yes. And so this is your go-to place to answer that question. All right. Then let's Okay, then people will ask about the Trinity. You know, the, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. All it means is a union of three and one. That's all it means. There's nothing mystical or strange about it. It's just, it's just a triad, right? It's just, it's a group of three that are treated as one. And so how many times did Jesus say, you know, I and my father are one? You know, he said things like that several times. Okay. And so we have Father. And the Son, the Word, Jesus, and we have the Holy Spirit. So these three make up the Godhead. And then we looked at several passages and saw that Father is the one who's ultimately in charge. He is the supreme authority. And then underneath his authority is Jesus. And Jesus submitted himself to the authority of Father. And he perfectly performed all of Father's goodwill. And he will always continue to do that. And then we are underneath the authority of Jesus. So if we were you know, we're not in the Godhead, but if we were to, you know, like have the Godheads up here, we are under the authority of Jesus right here. You know, so we are in his authority. He is our head. Um, he is the head of Christ and we are the body of Christ, right? So we looked at that. And then we saw that there are several passages where you can see that the three are referred to as a Godhead and, and they're spoken of together in passages, right? And so first of all, we saw in Genesis where God was speaking in the word God itself. Elohim is actually a plural word. It's not singular. I mean, sometimes it's used in a singular sense, but the primary um, interpretation of this word is it is plural and it means gods with an S on the end. And so, and then we have verse 26, which is, is extremely telling. It says, then God said, let us. Um, it does not say, let me make man in my image. It says, let us make man in our image. And so it's a plural, it's a plural term. And it even has other plural terms to go along with the plural word for God. Okay. So it's not God as in a singular person or personality, but it's us. It's the Godhead. It's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we can also see that even in verses one to three, we can see that um, God referring to Father, we see reference to the Spirit of God, and we see reference to the Word of God. And so that's how creation was carried out. It's the Father's will. It's by way of his word, which became flesh later as Jesus. And it's by the power of his spirit, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Then we can look at passages like Matthew 28, 19. And Jesus said, you know, baptize in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We look at passage uh, Luke 4, 18, and we can see reference to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We can go to Acts 10. 38, and we see reference to um, God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. We can come to Romans 1.20 and Colossians 2.9-10, and we see reference to the Godhead. 
Okay, so we've proven beyond any shadow of a doubt the concept of Godhead is absolutely true, and the word is in the Bible. The concept of Trinity is absolutely true, even though the term is not in the Bible, it's synonymous with the term Godhead. Amen? So I hope that settles any questions that people might have. Then we started uh, talking about, you know, Jesus uh, is the word of God, and he's also the creator. So everything was created by Jesus, for Jesus, and through Jesus. And we looked at several passages that talk about that. All right. So now what we're going to talk about today is Jesus is the seed of God. So he's the word of God. He's the seed of God. And he's the son of God. He's creator God. So he has all these identities, right? So he has, you know, um, he's going to have, has a, a long set of titles associated with his name. And there's many things that he's responsible for, but he's also the seed of God, which allows children to be born. Amen. Because in order for children to be born, there has to be seed. Okay. So Jesus is the seed of God and we are born with God's seed. So that means amazing things for us. Okay. So first of all, in Genesis chapter one, there's the biblical principle that every seed produces the same kind. So no matter what seed there is, it will always produce the same exact species by, by default. That is a law. You know, whatever seed is sown, it will bear the same thing. Then God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed and the fruit that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Okay, so we have this passage. We also have um, all the other like sowing and reaping passages. Whatever you sow, you will reap. You know, whatever seeds you sow, you will reap. That works in the natural and it works in the supernatural. Every seed, by definition, by default, by law, every seed produces the same species. So if you're born with God's seed, then you are a son of God and you are of the species God. Okay, that's how it works. And, and so we see that, you know, every plant has seed, produces the same kind. Every species, like every Every flesh has seed and produces the same kind. So everything, all birth happens from seed. Okay, and let's just take a look at some scriptures that show us that Jesus is the seed of God. So in Galatians 3.16, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say and to seeds as of many, but as of one and to your seed who is Christ. Okay. So Jesus is the word of God. Jesus is the son of God. Jesus is the word made flesh. And Jesus is also the seed of God. His seeds produce life. Seeds produce the same species. Okay? Jesus is the seed of God. He himself is God, is of God, is the word of God, is the word made flesh, is the son of God, is the seed of God. Okay, then we have John 12, 24. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Okay, so what is a grain of wheat? A grain of wheat is a seed. So, so most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat, and he's speaking about himself, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if the seed dies, it produces much grain. Okay, so you can, you know, if a seed, okay, so the seed is alive when it's in the plant, right? So it's alive, and then it has to become separated from the plant. The seed has to become separated from the plant, and it's as if dead. But then if you, you know, bury it in the earth and water it, then it's going to grow, right? Okay, and so that seed that was dead, seemingly dead, has produced new life. And so Jesus is saying that he is the seed of God. He is that grain of wheat. And he has to die in order that he can be this fertile seed that will allow us to be born. So if it dies, okay, so Jesus died as a seed. If it dies, it will produce much grain. So Jesus died as a seed to produce an abundance of children of God. That would be us. So we are born with Jesus' seed. We are born with God's seed. We are born 
the same creature, the same species as Jesus was. Because specifically, every seed produces the exact same thing. So if we become born again with Jesus' seed, then we become the exact same thing that Jesus was. Amen? Okay, um, some more evidence. James 1.18 says, Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Okay, so of his own will, that's Father. Of Father's own will, he brought us forth. In the King James, it says he begat us. Okay, he birthed us. So we have been birthed. And he brought us forth, he birthed us. He begat us. By what? By the word of truth. Remember we said Jesus is the word of God. Jesus is the seed of God. And, and here it's referring the word of truth. The word of truth um, is the seed of God, is Jesus. He brought us forth by his word, by Jesus, by his seed, which is Jesus, which is the word. All those things are, are synonymous, okay? So we are born again as sons of God by the word of truth. Words are seeds. Jesus is the word. Jesus is the seed. We are born with Jesus' seed that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So we were born with son of God seed. We were born with Jesus seed. We are born with word of God seed. And, and every seed produces the same kind. Amen. Jesus is the word, is the seed of God. We are born with God's seed. And so we are the same creature that Jesus was. Okay. And it says, um, I don't know if I have the passage here. Okay. Yeah, it's the next one. So in Romans 8, 29, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Okay, so for whom he foreknew, for whom father foreknew, father also predestined to be conformed, which means made into the complete image of his son, Jesus. Okay, so we are predestined to be completely conformed, completely made into the exact image and likeness of Jesus. That is our destiny. That is, that is, being, that is being worked in us. Um, it's already worked to a large degree. There's still obviously perfection that has to happen within us. And there's more that will happen to us after we die to complete the process. But uh, our Father's goodwill is that he foreknew us, each and every one of us, he foreknew us, and we came forth in a woman, and then he has he is working to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. And it says that Jesus was the firstborn among many brothers. So we're the same species as Jesus was. We're not a different species. You know, a creature of a different species is not your brother, right? God doesn't call um, angels brothers and sisters. He calls only the same species. Like, you know, I have cats. So I wouldn't say that... Um, I wouldn't say that, you know, one of my cats is my brother or my sister, right? You, you wouldn't say that, you know, it, only somebody of the same species. I might say that you on the phone here, you are my brothers and sisters. We are the same species, right? And so you, you can't have a brother or sister of a different species. You're a brother or sister of the same species. So, um, so anyways, the point is we are born with God's seed. We are born with son of God's seed. We are born with Jesus seed. We are born word of God seed. We are born with word of truth seed. Every seed produces the same kind. And then the more we can lay hold of that concept, the more we're going to lay hold of the amazing identity that we have as sons of God. And we can go on. First Peter 1 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Okay. So here it says we're, we're not born of corruptible seed, we are born of incorruptible seed. And it tells us right here in the scripture, the incorruptible seed is the word of God. And we know from what we've already read in the previous passages that Jesus is the word made flesh. Jesus died as that seed to um, the Jesus died as that incorruptible seed to birth us as sons of God. Okay. So I think everything's pretty easy to digest until here. And in Psalm 82, 6, this is where some people um, have a little bit of a hang up. Okay, but I'm saying, don't be afraid of it. Just embrace your identity. Psalm 82, 6 says, I said, you are gods and all of you 
are children of the Most High. Okay, so before we talk about this, let's read John chapter 10, and we can see how do the people in Jesus's day interpret the meaning of Psalm 82.6, okay? And so they have a correct understanding of Psalm 82.6. So in John chapter 10, it says, the Jews answered Jesus saying, for a good work, we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? I said, you are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the son of God. Okay, so the mindset that these people had back in Jesus's day was that um, by him making statements like me and my father are one, they felt that he was blaspheming. He was trying to make himself as though he was God. And Jesus is using this exact same scripture here. Um, you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. And so he's using that same scripture. And so the, the concept, or the understanding in his day was that you know, he was positioning himself as though he was God, and they consider that to be blasphemy. And Jesus is furthering the argument that he is by using this same scripture here. So just be at peace and realize, you know, we are born with God's seed. Every creature produces the same kind. We're not a mere mortal. We are not a mere mortal. We are born with God's seed. Specifically, um, we are the same creature that Jesus was. So Jesus was a, a human, obviously. He was a human while he was on earth, but he was also born again by the Holy Spirit. He was also anointed with the Holy Spirit. He um, obviously was filled with holiness and he was filled with power because he had the Holy Spirit. And so he, in, in that state, died as a seed. And then we are born by believing, we are born again by believing in Jesus, and we are born with that seed that died. So just as Jesus was when he died, we are born that same thing. Amen? So that means that we are human right now. We are, we are part human, but we are also born by the Spirit of God. Hopefully, we're also baptized with the Holy Spirit. And if we're baptized with the Holy Spirit, then we also have the miraculous power of God, which we need to increase in our ability to release that power to, you know, further doing the works of Jesus. Okay. And then there will be a further culmination into the likeness of Jesus as he is now. We will further culminate into that once, once we die and leave this earth. Okay. So for now, just lay hold of the fact we are born with Jesus seed or the same species as he was when he left this earth. We are the same species, same creature that he was, a human filled with the Spirit of God, anointed with the Spirit of God, born again by the Spirit of God, with the power of God, with the authority of Jesus Christ. That is who we are. Just as Jesus was when he died, we are that same thing right now. Amen? All right. So let's look at this picture. So we can see that Jesus was born of a, and us also. Jesus was born of a woman and born of water. Jesus was born of the Holy Spirit. And if we're born again, we also are born of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was baptized with the Holy Spirit. And hopefully we are as well. Jesus was anointed with power to perform miracles. And if we have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, then we also are anointed with power to perform miracles. And then Jesus has... He's at step number five. We're not, but Jesus, um, he has now received a glorious body. And whenever we die, we will receive that exact same glorious body as he has. So on this earth, like right now, we're to point number four, hopefully. Okay. And so we are the same species, species Jesus was when he left this earth. So he left between four and five, right? So when he left this earth, when he died, he was born again, baptized with the Holy Spirit, anointed with power, power to perform miracles, and then he died as that creature. Now that he's gone upstairs, now he has a glorified body, and he can come and go miraculously, appear, disappear. He has flesh, yet he's a spirit, so it's something beyond my imagination. I don't know how to imagine what exactly he's like, okay, but we will receive that same exact glorious body. So we were born with Jesus' seed, and so we're the same thing as he was on earth now, 
and we will be the same thing that he is now upstairs when we go upstairs. Okay. So that seed will continue to work and we will have further transformation when we go upstairs. And so let's just prove it all. And so I have Jesus on the left and believers on the right. In Luke 135, and the angel answered and said to Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Okay, so we have Mary. So Mary, obviously she's a woman. And so Jesus was born of a woman, but he was also born uh, of, of God. Okay, so it says, first of all, he's born of Mary, right? So that's step number one. You have to be born of a woman or born of water. That, that's a synonymous terminology. Born of a woman, born of water, it's the same thing. Okay, and he was. So Mary, he was born of Mary. Then it says, the Holy Spirit came upon Mary. So Jesus was born by a woman in a woman, but he was born by the Holy Spirit who impregnated her, right? So he's born of the Spirit. Okay, well, what about us? So in John 3, 5 to 6, it says, Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Okay, so these are the same two steps that, that Jesus experienced. So we are born of the water, are born of a woman, and then if we're born again, you know, if we believe in Jesus and confess him as Lord, then we are born of the Spirit, just like Jesus was. Now, Jesus, he was born of the Spirit while he was in the, you know, immediately in the womb, whereas we become born again at some point in our life. Okay, so that's a distinction, right? So he was directly born of the Spirit, whereas we become born of the Spirit. Okay, then in Acts 10, 38, it says, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with them. Okay, so we have Jesus was anointed, or you can use the term baptized, with the Holy Spirit. So that's point number three, baptized with the Holy Spirit and, and with power. So he was anointed with power as well, which comes with the Holy Spirit. So that's point number four, it's power to perform miracles. Okay. And then by way of the Holy Spirit and by way of the, the power of that anointing, he was abounding and doing good. And he was abounding and healing and casting devils and raising the dead and all the other miraculous deeds that he did because God was with them. Okay. So you can see that he was baptized with the Holy Spirit, anointed with the power of God, and that enabled him to do an abundance of miracles. Okay, now let's look at ourselves. In Acts chapter 1, verses 5 to 8, where John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea. Uh, in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Okay, so it's the exact same thing that Jesus went through. So Jesus, you know, Jesus, he was not born baptized with the Spirit. He was born by the Spirit. And then later in life, he became anointed with the Spirit. Okay, so it's the same thing for us. So you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So they were already born again at this point. So they were born again, they were born by the Spirit, but they were not baptized with the Spirit. Okay, so just as Jesus was baptized with the Spirit when he was 30 years old, it was a, a secondary event to being born again. The same thing is true for us. Being baptized with the Spirit is a secondary event. It's not, it doesn't happen necessarily at the same time. Okay, and, and so that's point number three for us. We get baptized with the Holy Spirit. And when we get baptized with the Holy Spirit, we also receive the miraculous power of God. So we're anointed with power to perform miracles. And then because we have that miraculous power, then we become powerful witnesses, not witnesses with word only, but witnesses who perform the works of Jesus and greater works. Therefore, we produce the power of God so that people will believe in the word that we speak. So we are a witness to Jesus Christ who speak his words, but we also perform his works and by the word and by the works, people will believe. Amen. So we are powerful witnesses. Okay. So the same spirit Jesus was baptized with, we are baptized with. The same power that Jesus was baptized with, 
It's the same power that we receive. The same good works that Jesus was able to do, we also are equipped to do. So it's the exact same thing. Okay, then in Luke chapter 3, verses 22 to 23, it says, And the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon Jesus. And a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son, and you I am well pleased. Now Jesus himself began his ministry at about 30 years of age. Okay, so we see that, you know, Jesus, he's 30 years old when this event happened. So he was born again, like originally in the womb of Mary, he was born by the Holy Spirit. So he was born, born again, whereas we become born again at some point in our life. Okay, so, but it was, it wasn't until he was 30 years old when he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And when he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, he also received the power of God. And then when he received the power of God, then he was able to begin his miracle ministry. So his miracle ministry did not begin before he was 30 years old. I mean, there's people that will invent stories that he was raising little birds from the dead and and different things like that. And that's those are nice stories, but that's not what the scripture says. His miracle ministry began after he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit when he was 30 years old. Amen. Okay, so um, for us, you know, Luke 24, 49, behold, I send the promise of my father upon you, but tarry, but wait in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. So again, the same spirit, the promise of the promise of my father, that's referring to the Holy Spirit. So we are promised the Holy Spirit. We are promised the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I will pour my spirit upon all flesh. Okay. So we, we have that promise. And, and, and so that's point number three, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay. And then along with the baptism, we are endued. The word endued means to be clothed with. So I always like to imagine, and Mitchell's got this picture of this huge polar bear that's like twice as tall as him, this huge polar bear. So if you could like climb inside of that polar bear skin, you know, you are endued with that polar bear skin. You are clothed with that mighty, powerful polar bear skin. So, you know, I like to think of it like that. You know, we are endued, like the Holy Spirit is upon us, like this powerful clothing is upon us. It's, it's upon us. It's on the outside. The, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is external. You are anointed. Anointed is not inside. Anointed, when you anoint somebody, you like pour, you pour oil on somebody. You have anointed them. It's on the outside. So when we are the baptism of the Holy Spirit is an external thing with this externally applied miracle power of the Holy Spirit. It's upon us. So it's like climbing inside that big polar bear skin. You know, if you could do that and just take on all that power and might, you know, that's what we're doing with this in doing a power of the Holy Spirit. And so he's just the power of God is upon us. And so in order to release that power, though, we need to have belief. We need to exercise authority and, and we need to we need to practice, you know, the more we practice trying to release the power of God by ministering to needs of people and by praying in authority, the more and more we're going to see that power manifest. All right. So again, it's the same thing, same spirit that Jesus had, same spirit we received, same power that enabled Jesus's ministry is the same power that we received. All right. Now let's look at Luke 7, 22. This describes the works that Jesus was doing. Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things you have seen and heard, that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them. Okay, so when it says that Jesus went off to perform ministry, um, Luke 7.22 summarizes the ministry that Jesus was doing. He was healing the sick and restoring sight to the blind, making the lame walk, cleansing the lepers, bringing hearing to the deaf, raising the dead. And any other form of healing, devil casting, all those things, multiplying food, um, preaching, you know, we preach way more effectively by the power of the Holy Spirit than just by human means. So all these things were ministry works that Jesus was doing. Plus, I mean, the list is even bigger than that. Well, these are things that Jesus told us that we would, that we would do, that anyone who believes in him will do the same works and even greater works. So most assuredly, I say to you, I mean, most assuredly, without a doubt, I confidently tell you, I confidently tell each of you on this call right now, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, 
and greater works than these he will do because I go to my father. Okay, well, contrary to what many of the so-called Bible scholars will tell you, Jesus actually meant what he said. We had the same spirit, the same power. He gave us his authority. We are fully equipped. We are the same species as Jesus. We were born with Jesus' seed. We're made exactly like him. And therefore, we literally get to do the same works that he was doing, healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out demons, multiplying the food, walking on water, and any other thing Jesus did, we do that, and we do greater works. Okay, and you know what could possibly be a greater work? Well, um, when Jesus was walking this earth, nobody was, you know, he wasn't baptizing people with the Holy Spirit. So baptism of the Holy Spirit, that's a new thing that was enabled after Jesus ascended. Okay, so that would be a new thing, which is a greater thing than was able to be done in times past. In times past, people you know, would have a temporary, um, a, like the Holy Spirit would come upon them temporarily to perform something and then would leave. Okay, whereas we have a permanent anointing. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit. So we have a permanent condition, born of the Spirit and baptized with the Spirit. It's a permanent condition, amen? And, and that will not be taken away from us. So that is a greater work than what. Um, Jesus was able to do when he was walking this earth, because it was after he ascended that the bapt uh, that the Spirit became available. Right. So first he had to go to the Father. It says right here. Okay. Another greater work would be salvation. So when Jesus was walking this earth, salvation was not possible. It, it didn't exist yet. He had not yet borne sins or anything like that. So we can leave. And being born again was not possible when Jesus was walking this earth. So he had to first do his work. He had to die and ascend before salvation was even available. Okay, so leading people into salvation, that itself is a greater work. So we have two greater works, at least. Okay, baptism in the Holy Spirit and getting people to be born again. Those are greater works than what Jesus was able to do. Plus, we get to do all the same miraculous works that he was doing, um, which we already mentioned. Amen? Okay, now let's talk about Point number five. So Jesus received a glorious body after his ascension. Now, Jesus is God, you know, God in the flesh. And now he has some unique glorified body. And I don't know, is it a spiritual body? I don't exactly know how to characterize it. <laughs> Obviously, I haven't seen it, but let's just look at a few things here. So, and after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut. And stood in the midst and said, peace to you. And then going to Luke 24, 39, behold, my hands and my feet, that it is I myself, handle me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you, as you have seen I have. Okay, so, so I don't know how to describe Jesus other than to say that he has this glorious body. This glorious body has the ability to appear and disappear. So that's pretty cool, right? So he was upstairs, and then suddenly he appeared in their midst. So that's you know miraculous. So this glorified body that Jesus has, it's miraculous. You know, he can immediately appear and disappear anywhere he wants to go. Okay, so remember, we're born with Jesus' seed, and when we receive our glorified body, we'll have that same ability as well. Okay, so he's obviously he's part spirit because he's God, but he also has a body and he's saying, look, behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. So Jesus in his glorified body state, he does have a body of some kind. Apparently it looked like him, at least at that point in time when he appeared to the disciples. And so he was flesh, but he was able to appear and disappear. So I don't know what else this glorified body can do, but I, certainly it's going to be amazing. So again, he's, he's part spirit, so he's the spirit of God, but he has a body. And so we are born with Jesus seed, so we will become the exact same thing that Jesus is now. When we go upstairs, we're going to be the exact same thing that he is now. Okay, and here's the proof. In 1 John 3, 2, it says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, or we shall see him as he is. Okay, so right now, we're the same species that Jesus was up to point number four. You know, when he was walking on the earth, 
He had all these characteristics, born of a woman, born of the spirit, baptized with the spirit, anointed with power. Okay. That's the seed that died. And that's who we are right now. Okay. Then, uh, then it says that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. So we're not yet a hundred percent like him. We are like he was when he was on the earth. We are not like he is upstairs in heaven. He has a glorified body and we do not have a glorified body, but we will have a glorified body. Okay. So when he is revealed, we shall be made completely like him. Okay. And Philippians 3, 20 to 21 says the Lord Jesus, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Okay, so this passage reveals that we're going to be made exactly like Jesus is. So Jesus has a glorified body that we just had a tiny little glimpse of back in the Gospels. We know it can appear and disappear. We know it's flesh at some times, but yet it can disappear and reappear. So I have no idea what all the characteristics of the glorious body are, but surely it's amazing. And it says that he's going to transform our, this lowly fleshly body into that exact same glorious body that Jesus has. So Jesus as our seed, which birthed us, will continue to work in us when we go upstairs and we will have that exact same glorified body that Jesus has. So every seed produces the same species. So on earth, we are the exact same creature that he was. And then when we die and go upstairs, we will be the exact same creature that he is now. So we are sons of God, born with God's seed, and we shall be the same as Jesus. That doesn't mean we're in charge, but it means we are the same creature, the same kind of body, the same kind of power, the same spirit. Amen? So I hope that everybody is convinced that Jesus is God. Jesus was the word of God. Jesus became flesh. The word became flesh. Jesus died as a seed. We are born with Jesus' seed. We're born to be the same creature as Jesus now, and we shall become further like him when we go upstairs. The seed will continue to work. We also saw that the Godhead is true. The Trinity is true. It's the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit acting together as one, joined together as one. So that is true. So hopefully that's answered any questions that people may have had about whether or not Jesus is actually God and questions about the Trinity.